The day was shrouded in a cloak of melancholy as I steered my six-year-old son through the doors of Chuck E. Cheese. Even though it was just two blocks down from my place, this was the first time I was visiting it in almost a year. It was a deliberate choice, marking one year since the universe cruelly snatched my husband, Anthony, from us. He had worked at this very outlet, a job he took up after abruptly quitting his position at a funeral home. Anthony had been a changed man after an incident involving the embalming of a dead priest. It had changed this cheerful, lovely man to a secretive, paranoid human in a matter of days. Whatever had transpired during that time, he took its secrets to the grave. His tenure at Chuck E. Cheese was tragically short. One fateful night, as he worked the late shift, a grotesque accident with a malfunctioning Chuck E. animatronic claimed his life. Now, a year later, returning to this place felt like a silent homage to him, a bridge to the brief memories my son held of his father. The visit started innocuously enough, with my son's laughter echoing through the arcade. He darted from game to game, his face alight with joy, occasionally pausing to munch down slices of pizza. I watched him, each of his giggles a bittersweet symphony that filled the air around me. I saw reflections of Anthony in him, in his smiles, his excitement, the way his eyes sparkled with each new discovery. It felt like a living memory, a piece of Anthony still vibrant and alive in our son. But in an instant, that warmth turned to ice. I looked away for a mere moment, lost in my reverie, and when my gaze returned to where my son had been playing, he was gone. Panic clawed at my throat as I called out his name. My voice lost amidst the cacophony of games and children's shouts. Desperation drove my steps as I wove through the crowd, my eyes searching frantically for any sign of him. The Chuck E. Cheese staff, noticing my distress, quickly rallied to assist. They were kind, their faces etched with concern, but the growing fear in my heart overshadowed their reassurances. Evan, a staff member, helped me. We scoured the place, our search turning more frantic with each passing minute. The staff made repeated announcements over the PA system, and some empathetic patrons joined our search, their eyes mirroring my worry. Even the CCTV footage was scrutinized by Evan, but it offered no clues. My son had simply disappeared within the walls of Chuck E. Cheese. As the place began to empty, the atmosphere thickened with an eerie quiet. It was then, in the dimming light and the fading echoes of the day's joy, that Evan made a chilling observation. There were five animatronics, a mainstay of Chuck E. Cheese, at that outlet. But when Evan counted, he came up one short. One of the life-size Chuck E. figures was missing. Our search became more targeted, leading us behind the scenes to the staff-only areas where remnants of joy gave way to silent corridors and locked doors. And then, breaking the stillness, we heard it. The unmistakable sound of my son's laughter. It was coming from behind one of the locked doors. We called out to him, our voices tinged with both relief and fear. He didn't respond. The laughter continued, haunting sound that seemed out of place in the deserted back rooms. Evan, sensing the urgency, shouldered the door open with a forceful push. As the door swung open with a resounding crash, we stepped into a scene that was as surreal as it was chilling. There, in the middle of the room, sat my son. He was cross-legged on the floor, his back to us, engaged in what seemed like a conversation with an animatronic Chuck E. Cheese. The room was unlike any other part of the establishment. It was smaller, almost claustrophobic, with walls adorned with pagan symbols and cryptic drawings. Candles flickered in the dim light, casting eerie shadows that danced across the walls. The air was heavy, saturated with a sense of foreboding that made me shudder. Honey? I called out tentatively, my voice a mix of relief and dread. My son turned his face, lighting up upon seeing me, but there was a strangeness in his eyes that I couldn't place. Mommy! Daddy was talking to me through Chucky! He exclaimed, 
pointing at the animatronic figure. His words sent a cold shiver down my spine. Anthony? Speaking through an animatronic? The animatronic itself was unnervingly still, its painted eyes staring blankly ahead. It was a grotesque parody of the cheerful mascot, its presence in the macabre setting a twisted mockery. As I moved to pick up my son, the animatronic's head suddenly turned to face me. Its mechanical voice, unnaturally cheerful, rang out. Hi, Susan. You look gorgeous as ever. My throat, my heart pounding in my chest. This was impossible, yet the familiar use of my name, the tone, it was unmistakably Anthony's, but how could that be? The animatronic, now animated with a life of its own, began to speak in Anthony's voice. It told a tale that was as heartbreaking as it was horrifying. Anthony had been haunted by the spirit of the dead priest he had embalmed, driven to set up this secret room for communing with the spirit. But the spirit had been malevolent, seeking a way to break free, leading to the tragic accident that took Anthony's life. Now, as a spirit himself, Anthony had found a way to communicate through the animatronic, waiting a year to speak to our son. The revelation was overwhelming, and I found myself drawn into a conversation with my husband's spirit. He spoke of a ritual, a way for him to come back to life. My heart ached with longing and hope, Evan protested, warning of the dangers of meddling with such forces, but I was too consumed by grief and the desire to have Anthony back. But then, a chilling moment shattered the illusion. During our conversation, the animatronic, supposedly channeling Anthony, failed to recall the name of our pet dog, a detail Anthony would never forget. It was then I realized the horrifying truth. It wasn't Anthony's spirit but the malevolent priest impersonating him. Panic set in as we realized the danger we were in. We turned to flee, but the animatronic lurched to life, chasing us with jerky, unnatural movements. My son clung to me, his cries piercing the tense air as we dashed through the maze-like back corridors of Chuck E. Cheese. The chase was nightmarish, the animatronic's mechanical laughter echoing through the halls as we ran. In a horrifying turn, Evan was injured, leaving me to navigate the twisting corridors with my son in tow. Soon, the evil Chucky had cornered me and my son. I swear to God, I had almost given up then. All I wanted was for my son to be safe. That's when I saw a reflection in a piece of glass. It was Anthony's spirit. It was a fleeting image, but it gave me a sliver of hope. His spirit guided an axe to fall beside me, and with a surge of adrenaline, I picked it up and swung it with all my might, once and again and again, severing the animatronic Chucky into pieces. Grabbing my son, we rushed out of the building, the angry howls of the priest's spirit echoing behind us as the lights flickered wildly. We escaped into the night, the horrors of Chuck E. Cheese behind us, but the memory of that night would haunt us forever. I was seven when it happened. My family and I were visiting Chuck E. Cheese, which was once the best pizzeria in town. It was my birthday, and my parents wanted to treat me with the best food and entertainment money could buy, within our budget, of course. Now, at first, you might be thinking that I'm the victim of this story. No, far from it. I was only a witness. At the time, it was just my sister and I along with our parents. Margaret was around five years old. It had just turned five in the afternoon when we pulled up in the car park outside and the weather was far too cold to stay out in for too long. Once we were out of the car, we hurried inside as a flood of people came rushing out, all walking to their cars. It must have been the entire restaurant that left as the second we were inside, we realized that it was just us. The restaurant was practically empty. As my eyes scanned over the room, I was quite shocked at the state of the place. There were tipped over tables, food splattered against the floor, and not a worker in sight to deal with any of it. Do you want to go somewhere else, Kathy? My father asked. There's got to be at least one table still free. Could we have a look? My father smiled. Of course we can, honey. Just as the four of us started walking, my eyes tracked something moving in the far side of the room. I turned my head to follow it, 
I was now staring at the face of Chuck E. Cheese himself, his head poking halfway out of a door that read backstage. I felt my skin shiver as it began sinking further and further back into the door, closing it slowly behind him. Suddenly, my ears pricked up at the sound of the animatronics as they began playing a new song at the same time that my mother called out that she had spotted a table. Found one. We all swiveled around. The relatively untouched table sat motionless in the opposite corner of the room. It was right below the stage and extremely close to the backstage door from earlier. I had another scan around the room, but that really was the best we were going to get. So, cutting our losses, we all went and sat down. Ah, that's right. There aren't any workers here. My father pointed out. I need the toilet, Margaret wailed. Okay, Catherine, you take Maggie to the toilet, and your mother and I'll try and find some bloody service around here. And with that, the two of them stood up and began prowling the area for signs of life. I took Margaret's hand and began leading her over towards the toilet. To my surprise, the sign for the toilet was plastered right over where the backstage sign had been. Just a few meters away, I saw backstage written on an entirely separate door. I thought I might have just made it up in my head, so I pulled Margaret towards the one that had toilet written across it. On our way, I started to notice more and more about the establishment. The place looked borderline derelict, as if left untouched for years, left to rot. How are people still visiting? As we came closer to the door, I stopped to peer at it. There were these foul and grubby finger marks plastered all over it. I ignored it again. If the rest of the place looked so disgusting, then it was no surprise that the door would be the same. I could see Margaret needed the toilet badly. She was starting to squirm. I took a deep breath, placed my hand on the door, and in we went. It was completely pitch black inside. As I tried to find the light switch, taking Margaret's hand behind me, I led the both of us along the wall, searching for it. We had only moved a couple of meters, but the darkness had completely enveloped the both of us, even though the door was still wide open, letting just enough light in for us to see a figure pop up from behind us. The light suddenly cut out as the door slammed shut. Someone was in there with us. I held Margaret close to me, staring at where the door was. A red light suddenly appeared. The face of Chuck E. Cheese appeared with it. It hovered for a moment, not moving, just staring. After just a few seconds, it vanished. I held Margaret even tighter as I began sprinting away in the darkness. I couldn't see where I was going, but any direction was better than the one that led to that thing. The panic blinded me. I ran straight into a wall, almost with enough force to knock myself out. For a moment, I lay on the ground, dazed and confused. Once I regained some sense, I realized that my hand had let go of Margaret's. I went into a frenzy. I threw my body around the floor, begging to find her, but to no avail. Hope was slipping until I heard a shuffling noise emerge from behind me, followed by a muffled scream. Got you. I only had one choice. I leapt up and shrieked as loud as I could. All of a sudden, a stampede of loud footsteps came charging towards the door from the outside. The room filled with light as my parents came storming in. What are you doing back here? At that moment, I realized we weren't in the bathroom at all. I was backstage. My parents' eyes soon stopped staring at me when all three of us noticed the Chuck E. Cheese mascot standing in the corner of the room right next to the exit door. One of its hands was leaning on it. The other clutched hold of Margaret. There was a large gash on her forehead. Her eyes were closed. I turned back to face my father, but he was already charging towards it. In response, the mascot dropped Margaret and threw itself out the door. My dad lost it down the alleyway outside. After that, we called both the police and an ambulance for Margaret. The police investigated the place and found bodies scattered all over. There were a few under the stage, but the main lot were all stuffed behind boxes backstage. Margaret had been this close to joining them. Shortly after, the police shut the place down. The mascot responsible for it all was never caught. However, the police had managed to find the costume. They reported that it was filled with dried blood and bits of rotten flesh. Nobody knows what happened to the person inside. Our family never returned to a Chuck E. Cheese after that. 
Every costume could be hiding the murderer. It was only a matter of time. Musophobia. Sometimes I wonder how such a rare word, a word that hardly anyone knows, means so much in my life. Musophobia is the irrational fear of rats. However, to tell you the truth, my fear is not irrational. There was a time when rats didn't scare me. Maybe they disgusted me a little bit, but never fear as intense and as strong as the one I feel now. Do you know what calls this phobia? A sick, disgusting, but most of all, evil being. It all started while I was working at Chuck E. Cheese. I know, an ironic job to start being afraid of rats. The Chuck E. Cheese in my area had a reputation for being a pretty clean place, but that's only what it showed the customers. In the kitchen and basement area, the place was pretty dirty. That wasn't always the case. The place used to be clean and well kept. That all changed when Adam, the new manager, took over. Make no mistake, The man loved Chuck E. Cheese. He was always very concerned about the place, doing everything he could to keep it running smoothly. The problem came from his personality. We would always see him in strange situations, walking with his head down, like he was hiding something. Many other times we found him spying on us. We were forbidden to call him on the phone or enter his office without having spoken to him first. Besides, something had changed on the premises. We didn't understand why, but the place had gotten much dirtier. The dirtiness of the place coincided with Adam's arrival, but he was not in charge of the cleaning, so it was inevitable to wonder if he had something to do with it. Anyway, as good a cleaner as he was, everything was fine as long as we stayed away from Adam. The only problem was that I accidentally got too close. That day, we heard a lot of noises from the basement. The place was usually abandoned. We had no reason to go there other than to check the boiler or water in the place. My team leader told me to go see what was causing the noises, but first I had to ask the manager for authorization. Adam's door was locked, so we thought he was locked in as usual, and we knew we shouldn't disturb him at that point. At that point, I decided that I was going to act without the manager's authorization. There was no way I was going to get in trouble since even a cook like me should have a minimum of autonomy to work, so I simply went down the locked basement that was located in the warehouse. I must admit that once inside, The place looked darker and more imposing. It was as if you took a haunted room out of a horror movie and put it in part of a Chuck E. Cheese. With the darkness rolling around me and the strange feeling that I was making a horrendous mistake, I took my first steps into the basement, and that's when I saw it. At the end of the room, I could see a dark silhouette moving, and it was the cause of the noises. You see, normally, in a situation like this, the obvious decision would be to call security, right? Well, not in my case. There was something else that caught my attention about the silhouette. I could see he had the manager's jacket on. How had he gotten Adam's clothes? Had he stolen it? I approached the man to confirm my suspicions. Was this Adam? What was he doing here? And why was he staring so obsessively at a drawer? Any other person would have noticed my presence, but not him. He was staring at that drawer so obsessively that he didn't seem to notice anything around him. Once I got some distance behind him, I could confirm that it was him. But it was like he was in a trance. Hey boss, are you okay? As soon as I touched his back, the man was startled and dropped the box, which fell to the ground. And do you know what was in that box? Rats! The box was full of rats! Dozens and dozens of rats covered the entire basement of Chuck E. Cheese. They were desperate, running from one side to the other, escaping or looking for food. All the rats started running desperately all over my body, while Adam seemed to go into a state of panic and go completely crazy. No! My rats! Come here! Boss? You! This is your fault! You caused this! Boss, I'm sorry. It was an accident. You won't get out of here alive, you know. I always wanted to get my hands on you. On that round little face. I always wanted to smash it. I tried to reason with Adam, but it was impossible. At that point, he was totally out of it. Suddenly, I heard a scream coming from the stairs. It was a co-worker. Oh, God! 
god, what happened? Did you find a rat's nest? No! They're my rats! Leave them alone! They're mine! Faced with another person, Adam seemed to forget about me for a moment, and I took the opportunity to run for the exit. Once I got to the door, both my coworker and I panicked at the horrifying sight. Adam was lying on the floor, jumping up and down to grab all the rats that were still running around in his arms. The terrified and hungry rats were biting him in self-defense, but he didn't care. He just kept grabbing them. At our perplexed look, he raised his head and looked at us once again. What are you doing here? Leave us alone! And that was all I had to hear. I closed the door from the outside and locked it when my coworker called security. Soon after, an ambulance came and took Adam away. Rumors spread fast around here, and we soon learned the truth. Adam suffered from a strange paraphilia that made him obsessed with rats. He was the one who brought the filth into the place, bringing and releasing rats to make nests in the Chuck E. Cheese, then putting them in his box and collecting them. Obviously, Adam never went back to work at Chuck E. Cheese, and if the rumors are true, he never went back anywhere, as he began receiving medical help in an insane asylum that day. As for me, I could never see another rat in my life. I had to give up Chuck E. Cheese because every time I saw the rat animation, it scared me. I can't help but think of all those hungry rats that scoured my body in desperation, looking to escape from a psychopath who held them captive. Every night, I think the same thing. What would have happened if my coworker hadn't gone into the basement? I think only Adam knows.